Hey guys, it's Super User Stand here and welcome back to another video. In this one, I've got a brand new NAS I wanna showcase. This is the QNAP TS-464 NAS that they just released and QNAP was gracious enough to send over in partnership with Seagate uh, the NAS and the drives inside for testing. So we'll take a look at the NAS, we'll take a look at the insides, and I'll talk about my general thoughts about using this NAS over the last two months, and then we'll follow up with some testing in Plex just to wrap it all together. So let's get into it. If you're looking for a small compact NAS that is feature rich, but also on the entry level in terms of pricing, then I would definitely take a look at this because this NAS, I really think checks all the boxes, especially if you're looking for about a four bay NAS for your videos or your photos or whatever you wanna store. Uh, as you can see, it is really, really small and it holds your four, three and a half inch drives. And it comes with a you know, decently powerful CPU. This has a Intel Celeron processor it's got a Jasper Lake uh, generation processor. So it's a relatively new Celeron processor and it's able to burst up to, I think it's like two to 2.9 gigahertz. So really it should be good for everything you need to throw at it for your normal tasks. Granted, it's not gonna do your virtualizations, your virtual machines, but for your everyday tasks of storage, of transferring things, of even you know, running Plex, as you will see, it does actually pretty well. Now, the other features about this NAS is the IO or connectivity. You know, on the front here, you have a USB type A 10 gigabits per second uh, import, input that has a little button where you can, you know, slide in or slot in a USB drive and click the button and copy all of the files directly onto the NAS. It's a one touch copy. Um, you know, it's actually very nice if you're trying to transfer over your SD cards on the card reader, you just plug that in and you hit it and all your photos and videos get ingested into the NAS. It's very, very nifty. You have a bunch of LEDs on the front, a power button on the front, and then uh, onto the back for the rest of the IO. Now I said that this uh, NAS is relatively feature rich and IO complete because you have Another 10 gigabit per second USB type A, a couple um, traditional USB type A's. And then you have two, two and a half gigabit per second ethernet ports. So not just one, but two. Now this NAS does not have 10 gigabit per second ethernet ports. Those are a little bit more expensive, but you do have the option to buy an add-in card, which you can see here, you pop this metal piece out slide in the add-in card and you can upgrade this NAS with more uh, M.2 slots or a 10 gigabit per second uh, network card if you wish. Additionally, you have a power input at the very bottom. The power supply of this NAS is external. That is a little downside. You're gonna have to have deal with the bulk of an additional power supply. It's not built directly into the unit. But because it's also external, there isn't any fans associated with the power supply. It's kind of like a laptop style power supply, power brick. So uh, it's gonna be relatively quiet. Now, speaking of noise and quiet, the fan on the back is also pretty quiet. In fact, in my testing, the loudest part of you know, this whole thing is really the four drives that are spinning at either 5,400 RPMs or a louder 7,200 RPMs. So really, uh, when the drives actually spin down, this thing gets really quiet, so that's nice. This does sit on my desk, or I've been using it on my desk for the last couple of months, so um, you know, I think the noise levels are appropriate for this device. On the right side here, there is a latch a lock uh, that locks it in, locks the front panel in. Uh, make sure to unlock it before you try to slide the panel to the right. I made a mistake with trying to open this thing up without realizing that there was a lock. So I pushed and pulled and popped the thing off. Uh, luckily, I didn't break anything though, so that's good. The drives and the drive base come out really simply. All you do is you push down and then you kind of pull and it comes right out. Now, thanks to Seagate, they supplied these Seagate Ironwolf 
hard drives. These are only four terabyte drives, but uh, I do really recommend taking a look at the Iron Wolf drives, especially if you're picking up the QNAP at NAS. Now I have a, my personal QNAP is, is, a, is a TVS1282. If you want to check that out, that's, you'll probably find it in my channel somewhere if you search that up. But I've got, I think it's like 14 or 16 terabyte Iron Wolf drives in those. And that was, you know, that's not sponsored. That's, I purchased that with my own money. So I really do believe in both the QNAP and the Seagate drives. Uh, one reason why you want to get Seagate drives with the QNAP is because there is additional software. I, I think it's like health monitoring. I can't remember the, the name that they, they call it, but uh, they have the ability, or the QNAP NAS has the ability to read the health of the drives, not just the smart data. So it gives you additional peace of mind and there's also data recovery options should you purchase one of these drives for your NAS. One last point about the hard drive bays here. Uh, these are toolless bays. All you need to do is pop these off and you, know, you could take the drives out and these, you know, these are toolless cl clips. So it's really nice and easy to get your drives installed. And then once they are installed, just slide them right in and they're ready to go. All right, now let's take a quick peek at the inside of this NAS here. If I remove these four screws. I managed to slide this cover off and inside you're greeted with this metal cage here. You got the four drives and the metal cage and then the fan is built into one unit. The motherboard sits on this side, this end of the unit, and it looks like you have a bunch of screws that bolt this whole cage to the motherboard and or uh, a couple screws where you can take this apart. Now I'm not gonna do that on video just because that's gonna be a lot of effort, but you kind of get the idea of, you know, this whole thing right here. The reason why you may want to take this thing apart is because it has the ability to upgrade two M.2 SSDs on the motherboard. And then you all can also access the RAM. And really, again, all of that is accessible on the underside of this cage. So you really have to take it apart. If you're not very familiar with uh, hardware or you know you look at this and say that's that's too much just be aware it's not very easily accessible at least from you know what I'm looking at here uh, that's not to say it can't be done so just keep that in mind if you are planning on upgrading the memory yourself and or upgrading the m.2 SSDs on this unit but what is easily accessible you know just from taking off the case here is the PCIe slot right here. Uh, this coincides with the top, the top slot right here. So uh, you can just slot it right in and you can install either your M.2 adding card or your 10 gigabit ethernet adding card, uh, just right there. Now let me go ahead and put this back together and we'll take a look at how this performs on the PC. All right, what I've done is I've logged into the TS-464 and you can see here the information. This is a Celeron N5105 up to 2.9 gigahertz four core processor with four gigabytes of memory. Uh, currently it is populated with V4, four terabytes. <laughs> There's a lot of fours. <laughs> four terabyte Iron Wolf drives. These are, you know, you can see I've been using these for about 57 days now, just shy of, or just about two months here and I've got it set up at a single thick volume. So all the, that's kind of the setup scenario. Now what I'll do is I will connect to the NAS and transfer some files for you to see. Actually, real quick, what you're seeing here is me pulling data off of my uh, TVS 1282 ST3 NAS. That's a 12-bay uh, monster NAS and it's a 10 gigabit per second NAS. So you can see I'm pulling data off of that NAS onto my desktop. This is pulling anywhere from 800, 900 to about a gigabyte per second because of the 10 gigabits per second. So what I'll do is once I've transferred that over to this computer, I'll dump it onto the TS-464 
464 for you guys to see the transfer speeds of that NAS. All right, now what you're seeing is the files being transferred from my desktop directly onto the NAS here. And you can see that I'm getting pretty good consistent speeds. Uh, any speeds anywhere from 1.1, 1.2 to 1.4, uh, it'll even spike up to almost two gigabits per second sometimes on this transfer. Now, take this with a grain of salt because this is probably the worst case scenario for this NAS because again, I'm not using any SSD caching. I'm not using any SSDs in this array. And these four terabyte Iron Wolves are pretty much the slowest drives uh, because that you can buy because they're just about the smallest drives. I'm not saying the Iron Wolves are slow, but four terabyte drives are relatively small. Uh, you know, you can get 10, 12, 14, 16 terabyte drives, and those are gonna be writing a lot faster because the data uh, you know, on the disks are so much denser. So just, again, take this with a grain of salt, but even still, you can see I'm really saturating that one gigabit per, uh, per second ethernet line and spiking up to pretty good speeds here. Because again, the connection on the NAS is a two and a half gigabit connection. I have 10 gigabit ethernet cards on my computer and my router and, and everything is 10 gigabit per second. More likely than not, your network is only rated for one gigabit. Your, your uh, switches or your routers are only uh, you know, one gigabit ethernet, right? So that means you're gonna be topping out at one gigabit because of the other limitations in your system or in your network. So takeaway is the performance of this NAS is gonna be pretty good dependent and more likely dependent on your network rather than the hardware that is inside of this NAS. All right, now I've got Plex loaded up on the 464 here, and I've got one, two, three, four different videos, four different videos here. And I've got the first one, this is a 4K, 29 megabits per second, uh, H.264. This is a MP4 that uh, basically it's a YouTube video that I made that I uploaded to YouTube. It's a 4K video. so. Uh, what you'll see here is if I play this real quick and then pull up the resource monitor, the resource, you'll see that CPU is barely budging. It is, it's not even moving. And we're not doing any transcoding. We're just direct playing this uh, video file. Original 29.3 megabits per second, 4K, uh, no subtitles, nothing. So just direct play, very little CPU usage on this video, so that is great. That's partly because you've got hardware decoding um, on uh, the CPUs to, to be able to deal with these, these, uh, these type of videos. So buffering is in line with the video playback and you're not having any issues with buffering at all. All right. Now let's take a look at the next one. The next one is a 256 megabit per second 4K file. Um, and real quick here, this is, this is, well, actually it doesn't show anything here. So this is 256 megabit per second 4K UHD HEVC 10 bit. Now eight, because it's HEVC 10 bit file, there's gonna be transcoding on the fly. And that's where the CPU is gonna have to do the heavy lifting. And you can see this is real time playback. Um, I had to think for a second here, but it's able to buffer and transcode while playing back. And, oops, and converting at a maximum uh, quality. And then the CPU usage, 13%. Let's give it a second to update again, 2%. So uh, there, it looks like it went from 13.5, 9.3, 6.3, 10.9. So low teens in CPU usage. So that's really good. Now, if we take a step up to the next level, this is 30, 300 megabits per second. This is also HEVC 10-bit. This is gonna be a little bit more taxing on the CPU. 
And hopefully we can demonstrate that. You can see here it's playing back. Still no problem with playback, but average 18, 24%. Because of the bit rate, it's higher. It's 300 instead of 250. The CPU usage is gonna increase. But you can see again, um, it's transcoding HEVC 10 bit, no problem uh, with the video playback. And the last video here, this is 400 megabits per second. This is far greater than any video that you realistically you'll, you'll be wanting to play. And again, you, know, you can see there's a, there's a little bit of momentary delay as it buffers up, but once it does, it starts playing and pull up this in for convert, still convert maximum. Average usage, 18, 19%. You know, it's already done buffering, converting, so uh, it drops back to down to zero because it's not churning anymore. But you can see here, 13, 19, or uh, sorry, IO, yeah. So right around 20% is kind of what you're looking at. What that means is basically this CPU has a lot of potential to play even harder files to play back. And you know, depending on the files that you have, more likely than not, you're gonna have a lot of MP4s, H.264s. But if you do have, uh, let's say H.264, but then you want to play like anime, right? Subtitles, subtitles, depending on the way you translate those subtitles, not translate, but, but to show those subtitles, you could either um, you know, have it shown on top or you can actually transcode and burn them into the video and then play back. If you need to burn it into the video, that's essentially the same as playing back the HEVC 10 bit because you're transcoding on the fly. And uh, what I'm trying to get at is if you were to watch, let's say 1080p anime uh, videos with subtitles, right? And you need to burn it in, this NAS is gonna be able to do that for you just fine. And, and as, as you can see, even up to 400 megabits per second HEVC, did it transcode a no problem. So really, basically you can throw any type, most almost any type of video at this NAS and it's gonna able to do it on the CPU, transcode it on the fly and play it back for you. You can see like eight, 4K is fine. You know, 8K, 8K it might do, it might, might struggle a little bit, quite honestly, just because uh, you know, that's still very CPU intensive and that's four times the pixels as 4K. But um, anything up to 4K is, is not gonna be a problem. So hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of the capabilities of this NAS here and just how powerful the CPU is when you compare it to some of the other entry level CPUs. You know, it's not an ARM CPU. It, it, it's not, it, it, it's a full blown Intel X64 CPU. Even though it's a Celeron, it's still got four cores and it's still boosting up to 2.9 gigahertz in because it's a 2021 released CPU, the IPC is actually pretty decent on the CPU. So everything about it is great. And uh, let's go back to the conclusions here. So yeah, real quick, a summary. If you're looking for a four bay NAS that has all the features that you really need and you're not doing any heavy virtualizations or heavy lifting, uh, it's able to do basically everything you need from transferring files to storage files, even transcoding in Plex because the Celeron CPU is decently good at what uh, you know, you're gonna throw at it for Plex. It's only when you're doing the virtualizations or the, the heavy, heavy uh, VM stuff, that's where you need more and more cores and potentially a GPU in your NAS. Well, clearly this isn't, isn't designed for that, but just the regular storage of files, transferring of files, it does everything very well. And between the front IO and the rear IO, I think it is a very potent little combo, especially given its size, given its noise level or how quiet it is, right? And just the overall package and uh, you know the price is, is, is good. So if you're on the lookout for this NAS or you're on the lookout for anything like this in the market, definitely check out this NAS. I'll make sure to link everything in the description down below and I'll see you guys in the next one.